we have a, a, a really basic talk today, uh, which is really, um, Randy suggested that we go back over some of the uh, sort of basic definitions and things uh, at, at this point. We're sort of starting our, our uh, a new year uh, uh, for, for the ECHO program. And so uh, we thought we'd take a little bit of a look at definitions and concepts about addictions and substance use disorders. And as you see, I use the word addiction and then I use the word use disorder, which somehow are, are two labels that are out there now in just how we even define our, our uh, area of interest. Um, uh, uh, no financial disclosures. I, I did want to let you know that uh, um, Dr. Kevin Savarino, Savarino has led the AAAP annual review on, on this exact topic for years now. And so I called him up and borrowed some of his uh, uh, slides. He, he's done a really good job on this for years. And he's much funnier than me. So unfortunately, he, I, I can't really tell his jokes. Um, so mostly we're going to talk about definitions and a little bit about what impact this has on epidemiology. I mean, we change our definitions in uh, the DSM-5, uh, you know, us crazy, I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist, so I can say us crazy psychiatrists uh, change our uh, definitions of things every few years. Uh, and uh, the, the good news I'm going to tell you at the end is it didn't really change the epidemiology very much. Uh, so it's not like we suddenly have twice as many uh, people with use disorders or whatever. It's, it's pretty close. Uh, so what is an addiction? Uh, I've been through long enough now that we used to use the word addiction, then we stopped using the word addiction, and then it got in there again, and then we went to use disorders. And uh, um, it's, it's been all over the map. Um, certainly um, uh, in the general world, we hear about addiction all the time. We went through the period in the uh, 90s where everything was an addiction. Uh, you were the eating addiction, sex addictions, this addiction, that addiction, almost anything you did repetitively and you really wanted to do it, if you hadn't done it in a while, was an addiction. Of course, at that point you get to where Breathing is a huge addiction because, uh, you know, every time I stop, I really, really want another breath and I take as many breaths as I can and I'd even neglect my children if I couldn't get any oxygen. And so it got that bad, then it came back. But um, so we're always fighting with this, this word, which I think probably indicates all of the emotion that's attached to it. And we go round and round about it. But the, the three C's of addiction been, have been around a lot, and some use four. The compulsion to use, the loss of control of both time and amount of use, the consequences of use, and then, then craving. Another very simple definition that's been out there for years has been inability to control use despite adverse consequences. Now, those, I like to throw those out there just because they're easy to remember. And when you're in a fast office practice somewhere, they help you organize uh, questions. If you don't have a, uh, if you weren't intending on going through a structured interview about addiction or substance use, these help you remember what to, what to ask. DSM-4 had drug abuse and drug dependence. And drug abuse was something where you had just one of these four criteria occurring, I mean, this is always interesting, occurring at any time in the same 12 month period. Well, if you have one, it's always occurring in the same 12 month period. So I've never been able to get, uh, I've asked people who were on the committee and asked them, what was the argument that possibly could have led to that wording? But um, nobody, nobody really had a clear answer. But anyway, recurrent substance use, this again, all about consequences, failure to meet work, school, or home obligations, uh, getting into physically hazardous situations, getting into legal problems. 
uh, and getting into uh, social and interpersonal problems. There was a huge outcry because legal problems was almost entirely related, well, was highly related to your socioeconomic class. So you were much more likely to get into legal problems if you were from lower socioeconomic classes than higher socioeconomic classes. So uh, having a, a label of drug abuse that uh, was connected so much to that seemed ridiculous. And you had to never meet the criteria for dependence. And then drug dependence, as you can see, is three of these within a 12 month period. The, the only reason I really bring this one up also is because it, it did not use craving. So uh, it's hard to, uh, for most people, and it used the word dependence. And we're, we're constantly making people dependent on drugs we give them, uh, which is quite different than addiction and also quite different than a use disorder. People who are going home and exactly following, uh, quote, doctor's orders, unquote, are physically dependent on drugs regularly. And uh, depending on how close you want to uh, measure withdrawal, uh, you, can, you can show withdrawal to aspirin. Uh, so you, you could fairly rapidly get um, with withdrawal and uh, the like uh, mixed up with this. So something had to be done. Physical dependence didn't equal drug dependence. Abuse didn't either proceed or progress, progress to dependence. And the, the legal issue was a, a big deal. And we knew from epidemiology that substance use and misuse are arrayed along, along, along a continuum. And people wanted to get something that had a continuous uh, flavor to it. And so that led to DSM-5. And we currently, uh, I talked about substance use disorder, is uh, to a maladaptive pattern of substance use leading to significant impairment or distress is manifested by two or more of the following within the same 12 month period. And the first five are about lack of control. You take the substance for a larger amount or longer period. There's a persistent desire but unsuccess uh, and unsuccessful efforts to control substance use. There's craving or a strong desire to, uh, or urge to use the substance. The use continues despite uh, knowledge of physical or psychological problems, and there's recurrent use when it's physically uh, hazardous. So those are all the lack of control ones. Six through nine on this uh, slide are related to the um, uh, adverse consequences. You uh, uh, spend a lot of time either using, obtaining, or recovering from the effects of the drug. You recurrently uh, use, your recurrent use results in failure to fulfill major role obligations like work, parenting, et cetera. There's continued use despite recurrent social and interpersonal problems. And you've stopped or reduced important social, occupational, recreational activities uh, because of the drug or alcohol use. Um, the, um, that one always reminds me of growing up in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and we always thought that Sheboygan was highly organized around bowling and slow pitch softball because you could play either one while drinking. And uh, drinking was really what we were organized around in, in Sheboygan for, for most of my childhood. I gather it's a much nicer town than where I grew up. So anyway, um, the uh, final uh, couple are uh, tolerance and withdrawal, which are related to dependence and are not counted for prescribed meds because we may well have, the uh, person may well have had those induced while following appropriate use. So mild substance use disorders are two or three of these things in 12 months. Moderate is four to five. Severe is six or more. So you do get a gradation and a continuum of, of, of problems. And it does look like people with six or more have worse outcomes and need more treatment, et cetera, than the people who have two or three. Um, and it's kind of an interesting way to get that to that progress 
from mild to moderate to severe because inherently, uh, unless on one, it's very hard to develop all these problems on one day. So you almost always go from one to two to three to four to five to six. You almost have to have some progression, uh, which has been satisfying for those people who thought about the previous design not showing um, a longitudinal pattern. So that is the DSM definition. Now, the American Society of Addiction Medicine still has a, a definition out there uh, that also is easy to remember. Addiction is characterized by A, B, C, D, and E. Inability to consistently abstain, uh, which is a, a control dimension. Impairment in behavioral control, another control. C is craving. D is diminished recognition of significant problems. Uh, some people remember that D with denial because it's diminished recognition of significant problems. And E, a dysfunctional emotional response, sort of a, a compulsivity. Um, so you have the A, B, C, D, E uh, approach as well. Another good one for remembering in the office, what do I need to uh, ask? And then find uh, another way of looking at these uh, concepts is that addiction or substance dependence is first, a compulsion to seek or take a substance. Second, a loss of control in limiting intake. Third, the emergence of a negative emotional state when access is denied. So this is from George Kube in a 2008 textbook of substance abuse treatment. And it, it also gets at the idea that there is a binge impulsive state, a longer uh, onset compulsion state, and then a much longer negative emotional state when you're trying to stay sober, which we tend to call protracted with withdrawal now. And probably is what underlies everybody's recognition that the first year of, for example, staying off alcohol is very, very difficult. And we're starting, uh, and uh, AA, they're you know, also makes a, a, a big, uh, you know, awards the medallion and makes a big deal out of making it through that first year because that protracted withdrawal is, is very difficult to overcome. Uh, George Kube has led a lot of research that makes one realize that part, that that's probably um, mediated by uh, abnormalities in CRH, norepinephrine, and glutamatergic pathways in your brain that take that long to uh, find a new uh, and uh, healthy homeostatic state. So there are at least three constructs about progression other than simply the number of symptoms. Abuse to dependence, that didn't work. Impulsive behavior early on, uh, uh, using impulsively, and then suddenly realizing that you have to use it compulsively. So uh, another way of thinking about that is you use it initially for the substance initially for positive reinforcement, and then you use it to avoid uh, avoid negative states like withdrawal. So you're then using this the substance more for negative uh, reinforcement or the taking it away of a negative. And that's sort of the, the concepts. The last thing I wanted to tell you is that there was a wonderful part of the NISARC study, the National Epi Epidemiologic Survey on Alcohol and Related Conditions, where they looked at 36,000 plus uh, non-institutionalized adults in America and looked at whether the uh, definitions from DSM-5 differed uh, in uh, prevalence uh, from the definitions uh, when, uh, of DSM-4. And what they really found was that if you looked at prevalences of past year uh, substance-specific DSM-5 disorders characterized by two plus criteria, they were very modestly higher than those of DSM-4 dependence plus abuse for alcohol, sedatives, opioids, and heroin, 
but they were mo fairly modestly lower for cannabis, cocaine, and stimulants. Now, just to let you know what, how modest those differences were, for all drugs taken together, um, in DSM-4, uh, dependence plus abuse uh, affected 14.58% of uh, the adults in the United States. And under DSM-5, it was 15.67%. So there was a 1% difference. For alcohol uh, you, uh, disorders, it was 12.71 under the four and 13.87% under DSM-5. So I don't think anybody's gonna lose a lot of sleep about a 1% difference, but uh, it still made me feel better that we hadn't, uh, a, a psychiatrist hadn't uh, managed to uh, uh, screw things up uh, radically. Now cannabis uh, actually went down in, uh, uh, frequency from 2.91% to 2.54%. On the other hand, cannabis is changing epidemiologically uh, probably during the hour we just uh, spent here uh, because of, of legalization of various, uh, 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 not decriminalization, legalization, and all the other steps in between. Uh, is changing cannabis epidemiology dramatically. So the good news is it did not really change. Uh, the other good news is it gives you a chance to follow both worsening and improvements in use disorders by having those, those criteria.